All right. Let's uh, talk a little bit about bleeding and shock. You know, one of the immediate threats to life is hemorrhage. Uh, the other has to do with an obstructed airway. Uh, so we'll talk about the importance of recognizing bleeding, uh, particularly bleeding that you can see, and uh, the new hemorrhage control guidelines that reference uh, how to control bleeding. And, you know, we want to be able to control bleeding because if we allow the patient to continue to bleed, um, they lose blood. And within blood uh, are red cells, and red cells carry oxygen. And um, lack of the ability to carry oxygen leads to shock, which is inadequate tissue oxygenation. And shock leads to death. So it's kind of a deadly spiral, and... When we recognize it, we need to uh, control it with some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. So, if I can get the presentation to advance. There we go. The circulatory system is a closed system. It's made up of three primary components. You have your heart, which serves as the pump for the system. You have your vessels, both arteries and veins, that are capable of dilating or constricting depending upon the need, and it's full of blood. Not 100% full all the time, but relatively full. Um, so the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood make up the main components of the circulatory system. We know that arteries carry oxygen-rich blood away from the heart. And arteries are composed of uh, thick muscular walls, uh, actually smooth muscle, that enable the arteries to dilate or constrict. Now, the importance of arteries being able to dilate or constrict has to do with uh, maintaining the pressure in this closed cardiovascular system. If you think of a garden hose, water flows out of the end of a garden hose at a particular pressure. So you got your standard 5 8 inch garden hose. Water's running out of the end. If you take your thumb and you make that opening, that 5 8 inch opening, half its size, the water pressure increases. So anytime the system constricts the vessels, the pressure in the system is going to rise. Anytime the system dilates the vessels, the pressure is going to drop. When your body has, you know, full vessel dilation, um, your container, your vessels, uh, are twice as big, so they're half as full. And that's going to lead to circulatory issues or shock, as we'll see. Now, capillaries are at the end of arteries. And capillaries are microscopic small blood vessels where the exchange of gas and nutrients takes place within the cells. So um, capillaries are single-celled vessels that pass directly through tissue, uh, allowing for that exchange of oxygen and nutrients. Then from the capillaries, the capillaries become veins, actually venules, and then veins. And veins carry oxygen-depleted blood, rich in carbon dioxide, back to the heart, so the heart can pump that deoxygenated blood, or that oxygen-depleted blood, to the lungs, where gas exchange can take place. And the process starts all over again. As a general rule, arteries carry oxygenated blood and veins carry oxygen-depleted blood, with the exception of the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary arteries carry oxygen-depleted blood to the lungs, and the pulmonary veins carry oxygen-rich blood back to the heart. Now, the importance of blood is that in addition to transporting oxygen to our tissue, uh, 
uh, blood supplies nutrition, uh, blood supplies uh, excretion, excretion of uh, harmful chemicals through the liver, excretion of harmful things through the kidneys, uh, excretion of medications that we take, uh, excretion of cellular metabolites. Um, blood also provides protection with the white cells, uh, part of our immune system. Uh, the white blood cells, and there are five different kinds of white blood cells, they circulate in our blood and provide uh, protection against invading microorganisms. And blood also helps regulate um, our body temperature. When the vessels fully dilate and the blood is close to our skin uh, through the normal processes of radiation, convection, conduction, perspiration, evaporation of sweat, those sort of things, uh, heat is allowed to dissipate out of our body. When the vessels constrict, when we're cold, that warm blood is, is sent uh, into the core uh, to help keep our uh, vital organs warm. So blood serves a, a variety of really important uh, purposes. Now perfusion by definition is uh, simply adequate circulation throughout the body. To me, perfusion means that blood uh, full of oxygen and nutrients flows to an organ or to tissue through that tissue and comes out oxygen depleted and nutrient poor. Hypoperfusion then would be inadequate tissue perfusion or inadequate blood supply to your organs. And another term for hypoperfusion is shock. Now there's different types of bleeding and it's important for us to determine when a person is bleeding whether we believe it to be severe. Hemorrhage by definition is severe bleeding and if allowed to continue and blood is lost you have no volume to circulate. You have no um, blood to flow to the organs, through the organs, and exit. Um, so hemorrhage is the probably number one cause of shock, uh, particularly in trauma. If I've got a trauma patient and I can see the bleeding uh, and they look shocky, uh, then I know that might be the cause. Uh, if they're bleeding internally and I can't see it, but I see all the classic signs and symptoms of shock, uh, then I have to um, believe that they are bleeding internally until proven otherwise. So hemorrhage is the most common cause of shock and trauma. Now hemorrhage can be either external, bleeding that we can see, or internal, bleeding that we can't see. And Depending upon what vessels are damaged determines the type of external bleeding. You can have arterial bleeding. Uh, arteries are under greater pressure than veins, so oftentimes uh, blood will spurt out of the uh, severed artery every time the heart beats. <coughs> arteries also carry freshly oxygenated blood, which is bright red. Uh, so if you've got bright red spurting blood, uh, out of a wound, you know that's arterial, uh, and they're going to bleed a lot quickly. Uh, veins, uh, veins more, it's a low pressure, so it's more of a steady flow. Uh, veins have deoxygenated blood or oxygen poor blood, which turns a dark red or almost purple uh, in color when it is uh, not saturated with oxygen. Uh, and then capillary bleeding uh, is a slow, even flow. Uh, it's usually red, uh, bright red, I should say. Um, but it's it's very slow and, and, and even and can easily be controlled with uh, direct pressure. Now, um, external bleeding occurs outside the body after some sort of force has penetrated the skin uh, and lacerates the skin or destroys underlying blood vessels. Um, you know, how, how much a person has bled uh, really is determined by the size and the severity of the wound, uh, the size and the pressure of the ruptured vessel, uh, and then how quick a person can clot. Uh, blood 
Uh, you know, what, one mantra that I'd, that I'd like you to, to think about uh, when it comes to uh, hemorrhage is that all bleeding stops eventually. Uh, you will either bleed to death or you will clot on your own. Uh, we can speed that clotting process up by doing some of the things we're going to talk about, uh, but patients may take medications like aspirin or Coumadin or Warfarin, um, you know, things that make it more difficult for blood to clot. So uh, they will bleed more than uh, those who don't. Patients with bleeding disorders like hemophilia uh, will bleed more severely uh, than others, and it'll be very hard to stop the uh, hemorrhage in those type of people. Um, massive hemorrhage, which is something that if we identify, we need to cons control and stop immediately. Otherwise, the patient will uh, bleed to death and go into shock, um, is usually the result of arterial bleeding. Uh, it's going to be bright red in color. It's going to spurt every time the heart beats. Uh, and uh, this is oxygen-rich red cells, uh, high pressure, uh, most difficult to control. And as a result, you know, one of the new uh, guidelines as far as hemorrhage control guidelines go is if I have a patient who is, you know, has massive bleeding or massive hemorrhage when I arrive, my very first thing I'm going to do after making sure the scene is safe uh, is a tourniquet because every red cell counts. Uh, we can't have these red cells running on the ground um, because that depletes every time we allow the patient to bleed while trying other methods. Uh, they're losing red cells. Uh, those red cells carry oxygen, uh, so they lose the ability to carry oxygen, and that's what causes shock, and shock causes death. Venous bleeding is going to be darker in color. Uh, you can still have massive venous bleeding, but because veins are under less pressure than arteries, um, the uh, blood is going to be uh, sort of a constant ooze. It's going to be darker in color because it's not saturated with oxygen. And again, you can lacerate some veins, larger veins, like your femoral vein, uh, that could create enough bleeding to uh, cause life-threatening hemorrhage. Capillary bleeding is usually slow and oozing, and it'll stop on its own you know, within a couple minutes or easily with direct pressure. Um, and then if a person, as I mentioned already, is uh, taking medications like aspirin or Coumadin or Warfarin uh, or heparin or something like that, uh, those medications are, are designed to uh, limit the body's ability to clot naturally, and um, uh, it'll be very difficult to control hemorrhage in those type of uh, patients. Uh, hypothermia also affects the body's ability to clot, and this is really an important bullet point here because uh, oftentimes when we have a uh, you know multi-systems trauma patient, uh, we're cutting all their clothes off, we're uh, giving them cold oxygen, and uh, we don't realize it, but we make these patients cold. Uh, and in doing so, when a person has full body hypothermia, um, they have a very difficult time in clotting. So if they're hemorrhaging, they're only going to bleed more if they're hypothermic. So, you know, you have to ask yourself these questions. How severe is this bleeding? If it's massive, if it's spurting with every beat of the heart, I need to control it right now. Uh, severe massive bleeding is all, also called exsanguination. So we don't want the patient to exsanguinate. We don't want them to bleed to death. Um, and this may be our top priority. Um, you know, we're taught the ABCs in assessment where we look at airway and then breathing and then circulation. Uh, but in a patient who has uh, exsanguinating hemorrhage, uh, your first step, again, after making sure the scene is safe, is a uh, tourniquet to control massive uh, hemorrhage from a, uh, uh, an extremity, uh, but then uh, perhaps a junctional tourniquet or uh, uh, very strong direct pressure, uh, almost like standing on it for uh, junctional hemorrhage if you don't have a junctional tourniquet. Uh, 
Um, you know, you should use standard precautions anytime you're dealing with a patient who's bleeding because, uh, you know, blood may contain a bloodborne pathogen that could make you very sick. Uh, you want to ensure an open airway and ensure adequate breathing. Um, you know, if a person is hemorrhaging, they are losing oxygen and an obstructed airway or inadequate breathing will only complicate that as well. Uh, you want to control bleeding only after assessing and treating uh, the prior elements. Um, and what they meant, what they mean by that particular bullet point is is incorrect. It says you want to control bleeding only after assessing airway and breathing, and that's not true. If I have massive external hemorrhage, the uh, new uh, current guidelines uh, would recommend that I control hemorrhage first and then address the airway and the breathing. <clears throat> Be aware for signs or symptoms of shock in somebody who's bleeding. And um, probably uh, the most effective method of controlling most hemorrhage is going to be good direct pressure. Uh, we'll talk about how to pro provide that. Uh, the use of a hemostatic agent or a hemostatic uh, dressing. And then the use of a tourniquet uh, to control hemorrhage. Um, now, this too is a, a little uh, um, different, and I, I'd like you to uh, just do this to yourself here. Uh, it says, when controlling external hemorrhage, apply direct pressure. Do that by applying firm pressure to the wound with a gloved hand and a gauze uh, bandage. And it tells you to hold the pressure until the bleeding is controlled. And if one dressing becomes saturated in blood, uh, put another one over the top of it rather than remove the dressing that's there. Um, you know, remembering that it takes about three to seven minutes to control hemorrhage with direct pressure, uh, we have to weigh whether we're going to allow the patient to uh, bleed that much, especially if there are signs of shock. Um, with uh, with direct pressure. So if you take your hand and you uh, wrap it around your opposite arm and squeeze really tight, um, you know, you can squeeze your arm pretty tight with your hand. But if you take just your fingertips and place your fingertips over where that laceration might ble be and you squeeze with your fingertips, you can apply far more pressure with your fingertips than you can by wrapping your hand around the arm. So the point I want to make here is that direct pressure, you want to apply firm fingertip pressure to the wound with a gloved hand and a gauze bandage. Once the bleeding is controlled, uh, the bandage um, can hold the dressing firmly in place uh, to, to uh, form a pressure dressing. Uh, you, once you apply a, a dressing over a wound and then cover it with a bandage, uh, you shouldn't remove the bandages, even if the bleeding is controlled. I know it, uh, you know, piques our curiosity where we've got to take a look and see if it's stopped bleeding. But every time we do that, we may disrupt clots that have started to form. And um, uh, we'll be back to square one. Uh, when controlled, you want to check for a pulse distal to the wound to make sure the dressing has not been applied uh, too tightly. And as a general rule, if you're putting a dressing on, um, you can't put it on to where you occlude arterial flow. Um, so I don't know that this bullet point is, is uh, uh, valid other than it's important to check circulation motor sensory. Uh, in all extremities uh, after we do, uh, you know, splinting or bandaging or those sort of things. Now, a pressure dressing, you can place several gauze pads on the wound uh, and then wrap a bandage around that, uh, those pads, and those pads would apply pressure over the wound. And that will help you control hemorrhage as well. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of what's called a reoccurrent turn pressure dressing, and um, you should have your instructor uh, demonstrate that for you. Uh, 
um, uh, when wrapping the bandage around the dressing, uh, I will put a 180 degree turn or twist in my bandage directly over the wound and uh, pull that tightly and then bring it around, make the twist over the wound, pull it tight, bring it around, make a twist, pull it tight, bring it around, make a twist. And these um, twists that line up and down the wound uh, apply very firm pressure uh, over the wound. Uh, certainly enough pressure to control most hemorrhage. Uh, elevation, um, you know, elevation, pressure points, those sort of things have lost a lot of uh, favor. Uh, certainly it's good to keep it at or above the heart uh, if possible um, because a dangling extremity below the heart, uh, blood rushes down there and uh, makes it more difficult to uh, control the hemorrhage. Uh, but you don't want to elevate uh, the extremity if there's broken bones or an impaled object uh, or if you suspect a spinal cord injury. Now, hemostatic agents are designed to enhance uh, direct pressure's ability to control bleeding. Uh, hemostatic agents work by applying um, the material um, to the dressing. Now, you can buy dressings already saturated with this, uh, these hemostatic agents, uh, or you can buy the hemostatic agent in powder form. Um, but uh, the powdered form hemostatic agents have lost, um, you know, some favor because we're not sure how much powder to sprinkle into a wound in order to help us uh, control bleeding faster. And if you put too much, there's an exothermic reaction that causes uh, second-degree burns. Um, so uh, most people, if they're using a hemostatic agent, they're using a dressing that is saturated with that hemostatic agent when they take it out of the package. Um, now, but when I mean saturated, uh, these dressings uh, don't leak or drip or anything like that. Just, just the... Uh, dressing is impregnated with uh, these hemostatic agents. And there's three different kinds that are out there. Um, uh, some use a potato starch, uh, some use uh, ground shells, um, and some use, uh, uh, probably the most popular one is a quick clot. And uh, quick clot is recommended by the Department of Defense, and um, they use uh, kaolin. And uh, kaolin is a white clay. Uh, that comes out of China, and uh, kaolin is the same thing that is found in uh, kaopectate. Uh, kaopectate congeals your diarrhea, uh, so it helps you stop uh, when you have diarrhea, uh, and kaolin on a hemostatic agent or a hemostatic dressing, uh, if packed into the wound, will help congeal the blood in the wound and will uh, speed the clotting process up. Uh, just about cuts it in half. The key is when using a hemostatic agent that it has to come in contact with the wound. It can't lay on top of the wound like we're accustomed to putting a dressing on. It has to be packed into the wound uh, in order for it to work. So here's the quick clot uh, combat gauze, um, which is a... Uh, uh, Hemostatic bandage, again, that's recommended by the Department of Defense. Uh, it ha it's quite effective in controlling hemorrhage. They all are effective. It's just this is the one that's recommended by the Department of Defense. <coughs> and um, to be effective, it has to be packed into the wound. Now, a tourniquet is something that you may use as your first choice in controlling bleeding that is massive or bleeding that you cannot control with direct pressure. Uh, tourniquets are used only on extremities. Uh, and uh, you want to apply the tourniquet an inch or two above the wound. Uh, here is uh, um, a mechanical advantage tourniquet uh, that is placed uh, over the wound, cinched down, and uh, twisted uh, tightly uh, to control hemorrhage. Uh, there's a combat application tourniquet or a CAT. Uh, there's a soft T tourniquet. 
um, there's the rat, uh, there's uh, just a variety of different types of tourniquets. Um, as long as they occlude arterial flow, in other words, they cut the circulation completely off distal to the uh, tourniquet, then they're effective. Uh, things that are not effective as tourniquets include belts, uh, blood pressure cuffs. The only reason a blood pressure cuff isn't effective as a tourniquet is it leaks. Now, if you've got a hemostat and you can uh, pump up the bladder and clamp that off so it doesn't leak or the bladder doesn't leak, you might be able to get the pressure high enough to occlude arterial flow. Uh, belts don't work unless you use some sort of windlash, uh, metal bar, a screwdriver, something that can be placed in there and twisted uh, to provide the pressure you need to occlude arterial flow. Uh, follow the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, once you apply it, we don't remove it or loosen it. Um, you need to let the provider know or the ALS service or whatever that a tourniquet has been applied um, you know, to the patient and certainly back in the day, you, know, you took the patient's blood and you put a big uh, T on their forehead um, to let them know they had a tourniquet on. Um, the patient's going to know because they hurt like the Dickens. Uh, and um, it's just important to let folks know because at some point it's got to come off. Uh, extremities can go up to six hours without a blood supply. Um, I think the current hemorrhage control guidelines looks at if the tourniquet's going to be on longer than two hours, you know, at about the two-hour mark, if you're still not where you need to be to receive care, uh, you might consider loosening the tourniquet, uh, but only after a couple hours. Um, you know, if you try to loosen it within the first half hour or so, uh, there has been one reported case in the literature of a, a person who re-hemorrhaged and almost bled to death. Uh, so it is important that uh, once you apply it, you don't remove it. So, when you're trying to control hemorrhage, ask yourself, you know, is my method of bleeding control working? If it isn't, you're allowing the patient to lose red cells. And with every red cell, you're decreasing the patient's ability to carry oxygen to their vital organs. Um, you know, do you need to get more aggressive? Um, how you evaluate this certainly is the presence of continued bleeding and the development of the signs and symptoms of shock. Um, now, we should have a systematic approach to treat uncontrolled external hemorrhage. Uh, they say begin with direct pressure unless it's massive. Uh, if you cannot control it with direct pressure or it's massive, apply a tourniquet. Uh, if ineffective, and the wound is on the trunk or the head, uh, pack a hemostatic dressing in the wound and put direct pressure on it. Now, splinting will help control bleeding as well, uh, particularly like an inflatable air splint because it puts circumferential pressure around the extremity and you can still see it through the air splint. Um, but if you've got broken bones, those along every long bone runs a nerve and artery and a vein, and um, if you can stabilize those sharp bone ends, if they've not already cut the artery, nerve, or vein, you can prevent that from occurring. Uh, cold. Now, remember we said that um, cold hypothermia uh, increases bleeding, and it does. Uh, when you have whole body hypothermia, uh, when your entire body temperature is low, uh, it affects your platelet's ability uh, to clot blood. But if you've got a small uh, wound uh, and you want to put an ice pack or a cold compress over, the, over that, it will constrict the blood vessels. It will help uh, control uh, bleeding, minimize swelling, and reduce uh, pain. Uh, but you don't want to um, cause hypothermia. Head injuries. Um, you know, you'll see some bleeding coming out of the nose or the ears in patients with basal or skull fractures if their eardrums are ruptured and their sinuses are fractured as well. Um, we don't want to control that. Uh, it's not going to be massive. It's just going to be 
oozing. We want that pressure that's inside the head to have a way to get out. Uh, you um, don't want to, to plug the nose or plug the ears. Uh, you want that to uh, drain, to flow freely. Um, you can put a gauze pad there to collect it so it's not running over the rest of their body, uh, but we don't pack those orifices. Nosebleeds, have the patient sit and lean forward. Apply direct pressure to the fleshy portion of the nose, not the bony portion, uh, but the fleshy portion. Uh, don't let the patient lean back because blood will just run down the back of their throat. can make them sick, uh, vomit. That will just make uh, matters worse. Uh, if the patient becomes unconscious, you want to put them in a recovery position and be prepared to suction. Again, it takes a good three to seven minutes to control hemorrhage. And one reason that a person isn't able to control nosebleeds is uh, they, quit, they take the pressure off the fleshy portion of the nose about every 30 seconds to see if it stopped. Uh, and that just allows those clots that have started to form to be flushed out. Now, most nosebleeds should be able to be controlled with uh, direct pressure. However, if the nosebleed is a result of something like hypertension or a really high blood pressure, uh, it may be very difficult to control, uh, especially in patients who are on uh, blood thinners. Now, internal bleeding is damage to the internal organs. Um, your solid organs like your liver, your spleen, your kidneys, um, pancreas, uh, they have very large blood vessels that run to them that give them a good blood supply. And when those internal organs are damaged, they have a tendency to bleed and bleed a lot. However, you can't see the bleeding because it's internal. Uh, so uh, you're going to, uh, you know, put everything together. If you've got a history of trauma and your patient is pale, cool, clammy, has all the classic signs and symptoms of shock, then you have to assume that they have in internal bleeding. Uh, internal bleeding can be caused by blunt trauma, that's a blow um, to a portion of the body or a compression to a portion of the body. That can be the result of a motor vehicle or a motorcycle crash, uh, can be the result of an auto pedestrian collision, can be the result of a fall. Uh, can be the result of being, uh, you know, hit or, or struck by a bat or club or, you know, two by four. Um, uh, it can also be caused by blast injuries. Uh, the supersonic blast wave that travels out at thousands of feet per second from the center of the blast site, that supersonic wave uh, can um, be significant enough to rupture hollow organs inside the body uh, as the pressure changes as that pressure wave uh, passes through the body. Um, also can cause a barotrauma to the lungs. Now, penetrating trauma, that's when the force of the trauma is very narrow or focused. Uh, penetrating the skin, uh, if it's a gunshot wound, a stab wound, or an impaled object, uh, tracking that path uh, knowing a little bit about cavitation or ballistics helps as well. Um, you know, you've got uh, three types of um, uh, penetrating trauma. You have uh, low velocity, medium velocity, and high velocity. Low velocity would be a stab wound, ice pick, knife. Medium velocity would be a pistol. Uh, and high velocity would be a rifle. Um, the issue is uh, cavitation. Um, when a person is stabbed with a knife, uh, they actually create a cone of damage inside the um, wound, especially if the knife is twisted or moved around inside the body. So it's not just straight in, straight out all the time. Uh, it could be straight in, and then if the, the end of the knife is moved around, uh, that blade slices and dices everything in a cone shape. Uh, with ballistics, when you're shot with a, 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 a bullet, um, the profile of the bullet makes a difference, whether it mushrooms, whether it breaks into pieces, all makes a difference on the amount of damage it will cause. But as the bullet is slowed traveling through the body and the body absorbs the energy of that bullet, a cavity forms around the bullet. 
and the cavity in in uh, medium velocity weapons like handguns is usually about five times the size of the uh, ballistic or the bullet. Um, when we're talking about high velocity weapons, uh, the cavity is uh, 15 times uh, the size of the uh, projectile or the bullet. Uh, that's why your entrance wounds may be very small and your exit wounds may be very large. Signs of internal bleeding, uh, you see bruising on the surface of the body, there's swelling, there's pain, um, deform, deformity, uh, bleeding from the mouth, the rectum, the vagina. Uh, their abdomen may be tender, rigid, or distended. They may be vomiting bright red blood or vomiting coffee ground emesis. Uh, coffee ground vomit uh, is an indication of uh, a very slow upper gastrointestinal bleed uh, that you, again, might see in a blast injury. Uh, dark tarry stools, uh, known as melana, very foul-smelling Dark tarry stools uh, are the result of um, bleeding, uh, that is uh, digested blood, um, or the blood may be bright red uh, coming from the uh, rectum, indicating a, a lower GI, an, an active lower GI bleed. Uh, with internal hemorrhage, you want to be looking for signs and symptoms of shock. In caring for a patient who's bleeding, maintain your ABCs, administer high concentrations of oxygen because they are losing oxygen and the ability to carry it. Uh, control any external bleeding. Again, that control external bleeding may be the first bullet point if the bleeding is massive. Uh, take steps to preserve body temperature. It's very important not to let these people become hypothermic and then provide prompt transport to the appropriate medical facility capable of taking care of their injuries. Now, shock is, uh, by definition, inadequate tissue perfusion or hypoperfusion. Um, shock also causes the inadequate removal of waste products from the cells. Um, there's a variety of different things that cause shock, but if we look back on the first three things that we described were necessary in order to maintain adequate perfusion, the heart, the blood vessels, and the volume, any alteration of one of those three things will lead to shock. So shock can be caused by the failure of any one of those three uh, circulatory components. Uh, if the heart is damaged or stops beating and loses its ability to pump, um, you are going to shock and die. If the blood vessels dilate and they make the uh, container too large, remember if the blood vessels fully dilate, the container is twice as big, so it's half as full and the pressure is going to drop in the system, leading to inadequate tissue perfusion and shock. And then, of course, just losing blood volume from hemorrhage will also cause shock. Now, when a person goes into shock, one of the very first things that you're going to see is something called quiet tachypnea. Uh, <clears throat> their breathing will increase in rate and depth in an effort to get more oxygen into their bloodstream. Their saturations are good. Their lung sounds are clear. You're just wondering why are they at rest breathing 16 times a minute or 20 times a minute? Um, that's a very, very early indicator of shock. Uh, then your body's going to re release compensatory uh, hormones that will help um, maintain the pressure in the system, primarily epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Uh, the epinephrine is going to cause an increase in uh, the heart rate. Uh, the heart is going to beat stronger and faster, which will help maintain cardiac output and keep the pressure up in the system. Uh, the epinephrine will also cause the blood vessels to constrict. Uh, when the blood vessels constrict, uh, blood uh, goes from out here in the periphery to the core of the body, so the periphery, the arms and legs, uh, become pale and they're cool because uh, there's no warm blood in them. It's all in the core. And they're sweaty because the sweat glands are under the control of adrenaline as well. And the more adrenaline you put into the system, the more you sweat. Um, uh, as a result of 
vasoconstriction, uh, the blood is shunted away from uh, the gastrointestinal organs, which causes uh, nausea. So the patient may feel uh, sick to their stomach. Uh, also, blood is shunted away from the kidneys. Uh, so one of the reasons that certainly a person dies from shock uh, is um, inadequate tissue perfusion, uh, but uh, acute uh, renal injury as well. Uh, the kidneys can be damaged uh, even in short periods of uh, shock if they don't get a good blood supply. Um, you have two uh, severities of shock, I guess you would say. The first one is called compensated shock, and that's when your body's compensatory mechanisms are working. Um, you see this early in shock. Uh, kind of difficult to, to, to tell, uh, depending on the type of shock, um, but we'll see that quiet tachypnea. We'll see that pale, cool, and clammy skin. We'll see that increase in heart rate. Those are early compensatory mechanisms. The blood pressure is going to be normal or maybe even slightly higher because of all the com compensation that's occurring. Um, that's early shock. Decompensated shock, where we draw that line between compensated and decompensated, is a drop in blood pressure. When the body can no longer compensate, the blood pressure starts to drop. Uh, and often by then, you know, we're, we're really in a, a severe state and a lot of uh, tissue have, has gone without oxygen uh, and is beginning to die. Uh, oftentimes, patients in decompensated shock, even if we do resuscitate them and get them back, uh, they die weeks or months later from uh, multiple organ dysfunction. Uh, so a fall in blood pressure is a very late finding uh, in shock. Uh, the different types of shock that are out there, hypovolemic is the most common, and that results from a decrease in volume of circulating blood or circulating plasma. Um, it's called hemorrhagic shock if the cause is bleeding, but hypovolemic shock can also be caused by burns where you lose a lot of plasma, can be caused by crush injuries where you lose a lot of plasma and water into crushed or damaged muscle. Uh, it can be caused by vomiting and diarrhea, uh, which leads to severe dehydration. Cardiogenic shock, the genesis of this shock is cardio, it's the heart. Uh, so it's seen in patients who have pump failure. Uh, that might be the result of a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. It may be the result from a heart that's beating too fast or too slow uh, or not strong enough. It may also be um, caused by hearts that are beating irregular. Now, neurogenic shock, uh, the vessels uh, fully dilate. Uh, with neurogenic shock. And you don't really lose any blood, but uh, because the container gets twice as big, it's now half as full. Um, it's rarely seen in the field. We can see neurogenic shock with high spinal cord injury. Uh, we can see neurogenic shock with certain overdoses. We can see neurogenic shock with tumors on the uh, spinal cord. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a rare thing to see, uh, but does exist. Uh, something to keep in mind about uh, infants and children related to shock is that uh, children uh, have very strong hearts. Uh, they're able to compensate very well uh, for shock, and they're able to maintain their blood pressure until almost half their volume is gone. So children will fool you. Uh, they uh, compensate so well. Um, their heart rates are normally faster than ours. Their respiratory rates are normally faster than ours. So you really got to be paying attention to children to know that they're in shock. Uh, but once they decompensate, once their compensatory mechanisms no longer work, they plummet quickly. Uh, so they travel along a line of uh, everything looks pretty good and then they crash where adults, you can gradually see them getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh, children aren't that way. So you have to recognize shock before that blood pressure crashes in children in order to be effective. So look for the signs and symptoms of shock in somebody who's bleeding. Uh, the uh, One of the early signs and symptoms of uh, shock from uh, blood loss uh, 
or one of the early signs and symptoms of shock period is going to be um, altered mental status. The brain is the first organ to show dysfunction uh, when it isn't getting an adequate blood supply. And remember that shock by definition is lack of adequate uh, oxygenation. The skin becomes pale, cool, and clammy because of the vasoconstriction and the increase in the sweat glands. Uh, the patient is sick to their stomach because of lack of blood supply to their gut. Uh, they may vomit. Uh, their vital signs, we will see an increase in respiratory rate, an increase in heart rate. Uh, initially, a very slight increase in blood pressure, and then in the end, the blood pressure slowly and gradually uh, drops. Uh, late signs of shock include thirst, uh, dilated pupils, uh, sometimes cyanosis, uh, around the lips of the nail beds if they um, uh, have enough red cells left uh, to uh, turn the blood blue, uh, then you might see that cyanosis. Um, transportation is the intervention, particularly for internal hemorrhage. Uh, when we think of uh, a patient's chance of surviving a traumatic injury, uh, there is a, a a standard out there called the golden hour. Uh, the golden hour refers from the time of the injury until the patient is on an operating table. If we can get them there within an hour of the onset of their injury, uh, they have a good chance of surviving regardless of the, uh, the injury. Now, we also know the trimortal um, uh, death in trauma patients uh, exists like this. Uh, there will be those trauma patients who die within the first few minutes of their insult. Uh, those patients have mortal wounds. Uh, they exsanguinate to death from a lacerated liver or a torn aorta. Uh, you know, within minutes they bleed to death. And the only way we're going to care for that patient who dies uh, within minutes of their insult uh, is prevention. Prevent it from ever occurring in the first place. Then we have those patients that are going to die in the first couple hours following their insult. And that's where we come in. If we can recognize early that the patient is in shock and we can provide adequate oxygenation and control hemorrhage, uh, we may be able to prevent those patients uh, from dying in that first couple hours. And then there are those that die weeks or months later as a result of all the tissue damage that occurred during shock. Um, so looking at that golden hour, EMS's goal is the platinum 10 minutes. Once we can gain access to the patient, and we're not hampered by extrication, um, uh, we should be able to get that patient uh, off the scene and heading down the road to an appropriate trauma center uh, within 10 minutes. It doesn't mean that we have to take a full 10 minutes. If we can get them off the scene in three minutes, then by all means we should do that. But I'm only talking about those patients who have uh, severe life-threatening injuries. Um, which is only about 5% of all your trauma patients. The vast majority of trauma patients may have a single isolated uh, ankle fracture, dislocated elbow, something like that, uh, where you do have the time uh, to alleviate pain. You do have the time to splint. You do have the time to uh, take care of your patient. Um, but in patients who are in shock uh, from their traumatic injury, we need to move them quickly uh, to a level one or level two trauma care facility. Uh, Iowa has an out-of-hospital trauma triage destination decision protocol, which will guide you on if the patient meets this criteria and you're within 45 minutes of a level one or level two trauma care facility, you may bypass your local facility and go directly to that level one or level two trauma care facility. In treating for shock, it is vital that you prevent heat loss and that you keep the patient warm. Uh, remember that uh, if a cold patient develops coagulopathy uh, and further blood loss, Coagulopathy is just a word that, that refers to the patient's inability to coagulate, uh, inability to, to clot. So 
uh, we can't allow them to become hypothermic. The back of that ambulance should be hot. You should be sweating uh, when you're caring for a trauma patient. Maintain an open airway and assess their respiratory rate. If their breathing is inadequate, then address it immediately and aggressively so that we can provide adequate oxygenation uh, and get oxygen into the blood that they have left. Um, give them high concentrations of oxygen, 100% by non-rebreather or bag mass ventilation, or if unresponsive, uh, a, a supraglottic airway device like the King. Control any external bleeding, and again, remember that that control any external bleeding may be your first choice uh, in massive external hemorrhage. If a pelvic fracture is uh, suspected, there's a variety of ways that you can immobilize a pelvic fracture. Um, it is quite debatable whether a pelvic binding device is the appropriate method or not. Um, the goal is to decrease the size of the pelvis. If you fracture your pelvis in certain locations, it opens up like a book. Uh, and there are major vessels that run through your pelvis. And if the force was strong enough to fracture those pelvic bones, it was probably strong enough to tear or rupture some of those large vessels. And if the patient is still alive and they've not bled to death from their pelvic wounds internally, then we have to handle them with kid gloves because aggressive handling and movement of that pelvis uh, could start the bleeding to uh, start up all over again and the patient could bleed to death. So decreasing the size of the pelvis uh, is, in the opinion of most, uh, the proper way to uh, splint a pelvic fracture. Um, how you do that, that's what's debatable. There are commercially available pelvic binders. There are uh, sheets. Uh, my preference, uh, which is the least invasive, uh, which treats the, kid, the patient with uh, certainly kid gloves, is just to put a pillow between their legs and tie their legs together. Um, that will close the pelvis uh, and uh, will uh, help control hemorrhage and then take a scoop stretcher and scoop the patient up and put them on the cot. Splint any suspected bone or joint injuries, prevent loss of body heat, can't again emphasize the importance of preventing heat loss, and then transport immediately to the level one or level two trauma care facility if their condition warrants. Uh, speak calmly and reassure them throughout the assessment and care that you're doing all that you can. Certainly don't reassure them that everything's going to be all right and they're going to be okay because you don't know that. What you do know is that, you know, their vital signs are stable. Uh, you've got the bleeding under control. Uh, you're moving them to a facility where they can care for their injuries. Those are things that you can reassure them about. All right, so that ends our discussion on bleeding and shock. If uh, you have any questions, you uh, certainly know how to get a hold of me. So thanks and have a great day.